Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, great. Can everyone hear me and the video? Can you hear me over there? Yeah. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is François Gambortier, and today I will um, present with uh, Ken Inkley, which is at the, at the corner right there, um, a couple of interaction techniques which try to understand how we can make uh, the relationship between people, pen, and computer better. Uh, so over the, the past couple of years, um, several kind of devices have appeared on the market or in the research lab who try to understand how we can move uh, from the normal interface with a mouse to a pen-oriented uh, computer interface. So I saw a couple of devices here, so uh, you're all familiar with a tablet PC. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, Anoto slash Logitech pen that I will, I will discuss about that later on. And here are two uh, research projects, which were the Stanford Interactive Mural and the Stanford uh, Interactive Table. And all these devices try to explore how we can have an interaction style on a digital surface, which is similar to the example I show here, which is someone interacting on paper. And while people are trying to do that, what, what all these groups are trying to do is that we all recognize that interacting of, on paper is both very intuitive and uh, many people are still doing it even so we have uh, so many computers around us. So the key goal of our research, uh, of our research progr program, both from, from my point of view and from Ken's point of view, is to try to understand how we can deliver an interface which will be as convenient and as uh, intuitive to use or as fluid to use as paper, yet will provide you all the advantage of being in a digital world where you can copy things, you can uh, have access to a dynamic document and such a thing. Uh, so during the talk, we will focus mostly on the uh, upper right quadrant, which is tablet PC interaction. And, uh, but at the end of the talk, I will uh, show a couple of, of research projects which show how what we uh, did on the tablet PC can be translated directly on this device, which is just a digital pen. Um, the first thing that can be said about the current tablet PC interface is that it's not there yet. And this is a slide from, from Ken. And I think it reflects very well how the current interface of a tablet PC feel. And um, it is, it is well, when you think about it, it, it makes perfect sense because the current interface, which is the window, icon, mouse, and pointing interface, was designed with a very specific setting in mind. Uh, it's a setting that we, we present here. It's a fixed environment, your desk. You have a keyboard which gives you access to uh, rapid access to commands through uh, shortcuts. And you do indirect interaction, which means that you have more or less infinite resolution because you can move the mouse very slowly and you can get whatever resolution the device can provide. And uh, of course, that makes some interaction very easy. So for example, double click is very easy because the mouse is stable. So as long as I don't touch the mouse and just click on the button, the cursor will stay exactly where it is. Okay, so now if you move to the tablet world, I have a very different situation all of a sudden. Uh, first, it's unstable, it's on your lap, it's on the table, you may not be perfectly comfortable when you use the device. Um, there is no keyboard, and I know that many tablet has a keyboard, but if you look at, if you try to see at the vision of what tablet computing should be, at some point, if we are lucky, there should be no keyboard. I'm not saying it's possible, but the, the, the vision go there. Uh, in that case, that means that the notion of using the keyboard with shortcut to uh, execute command very rapidly is no longer available to you. Um, you have a direct mode of interaction, which, which means that I interact directly on the surface, so I cannot have uh, acceleration like you have on your mouse, and I cannot have a high level of precision. And as a result, 
when you try to use an interface designed for uh, high precision, stable environment, in this environment, you have a lot of problem. It's very difficult to double click. It's very difficult to close a window because, unfortunately, the, the window closing box is at the corner where the uh, uh, calibration is, in general, very poor. And people really get um, upset about the use of the device in general. And, it's, uh, and as, as a proof, if they, if they need a proof, uh, you can observe that most hardware these days come in a situation where you always have a keyboard or you can plug a keyboard or you can turn the device and it will become a normal um, tablet or laptop computer. Okay, so what can we do? So if you look at a normal interface, you have two concerns that you have to address if you want to design a new interface. First, there is um, what some people call the chrome of the interface, what I call the interface framework, which is everything which is provided by the system to help you select the tool and issue high-level command like printing. Uh, currently, it's based on point and click, and the question is, can we do something better? It will be more pen-friendly. Uh, I will discuss about that approach, and it's called, the system is called Crossy, which is a picture of the system. The second problem is the document area because, of course, if you only address the framework area, you still have the, the main problem that you interact here, but all the commands are on the, on the margin of your display, which means you are going back and forth all the time, which is not a very convenient way to interact. Again, that's, uh, in a normal environment, it's not so bad because it's true that for beginners they will have to do that, but very rapidly you learn the couple of uh, shortcuts which are very important for you and you don't have to make this movement between the, the center and the border. So Ken will discuss about that part with uh, two systems. One is uh, Scribbly and the other one is um, Stitching. Is that another name for Stitching or just Stitching? It's just Stitching, okay. Okay, so we'll focus first on the interface framework. And uh, I will relate to work I did with uh, one of my students, uh, Georg Apitz, and was published in uh, 2004. Um, what we, we decided to do is to move from clicking to crossing. And by crossing, as shown on this slide, I mean that we have small target on the screen, and to trigger some action on this target, you have to cross them. Um, we didn't come to that idea just by, you know, a strike of lightning. Uh, in fact, there was a lot of, there are several papers in the literature that show that that kind of interaction can be as fast as clicking. And it seemed to us that, in fact, it was very well adapted to pen because when you use uh, a pen, you are doing a lot of, of stroke, that uh, very small stroke, like, say, crossing a T. Okay, so the question is, okay, so we know it's as fast as clicking, the question is, how expressive is it? Can I do everything I can do in a normal uh, window interaction on a crossing interaction? And to do that, to, to kind of understand if it's possible or not, we design a system called Crossy. And I will show you a video of this system now. And As many tablet PC users have noticed, Interacting with the traditional point-and-click interface can be a struggle. Rather than use the stroke, which is the natural mode of interaction with the pen, the point-and-click interface restricts the interaction to a series of discrete steps, like here where we change the attributes of the pen tip. In this video, we present a new interface based solely on crossing. In our application, named Crossy, basic interaction steps are strokes made through crossing widgets. These steps can be fluidly composed, as here, when we select the color and width of the pen in one stroke. In the next scenes, we display the normally invisible pen strokes on the widgets. Our system uses a tool palette with five buttons. Each tool, like the highlighter and the eraser, can be selected by crossing them from right to left. Other kinds of buttons are provided as well. To access them, we open the pen dialog box by extending the stroke outside the pen button. Here we see several radio buttons. We cross them from right to left to select the characteristic of a pen. As shown here, the layout of our windows makes it easy to select several attributes in one stroke. In Crossy, the left and bottom borders of dialog boxes are used to validate the selection. 
while the top and right borders are used to cancel a selection. This makes it easy for the user to call the dialog box, select the parameters, and validate in one stroke. We also offer checkbox functionality where several options can be selected at once by crossing them vertically. When only one selection is needed, the user can select the checkbox by crossing it horizontally. Our system provides other types of classic widgets, such as the slider. In our brush palette, we use two sliders to set the color and width of the stroke. To pick a color and width, the user may simply cross at the corresponding positions on the sliders. Again, several parameters can be selected in the same stroke. To open a file, we use the flow menu to call the file open dialog box. Here the user moves the pen up and down the file list where the current selection is always highlighted in the middle of the dialog box. To let users navigate, we only present unique prefixes. After a prefix has been selected, the user can complete this prefix by a simple horizontal movement. Moving the pen to the left leads backward in the directory tree. Once the desired directory is selected, another movement to the right opens the directory. When the target file is reached, another movement to the right opens the file. Different gestures on top of a crossing element can result in different actions. Our scroll bar, for instance, allows users to move to a specific location on the document by simply crossing the scroll bar at that position. After crossing the bar, the user can continue adjusting the position with varying gain. Also, the user can move one page up or down using different gestures. Furthermore, it is possible to repeat the last movement by simply crossing the bar again. A crossing interface, such as Crossy, makes it easy to compose several commands in the same stroke. To illustrate this feature further, we will now demonstrate Crossy's find and replace function. In the upper panel, one first selects the target width and color, and then in the lower panel, selects the replacement attributes. Crossing allows the user to compose these actions in one gesture. We can now search for an item and replace it. For the next match, we can decide to change the replacement values. With a slightly modified gesture, the user can search without replacing. Replace again. Or we can undo replacements. In this video, we have presented Crossy, okay. a new well, application. To, to stop that. By the way, if you have any question, let me know, and I will be happy to answer them as, as we go. Okay. So, um, as I say, the, the main uh, contribution of Crossy was to demonstrate the first the feasibility and the expressiveness of crossing as a paradigm for interaction design and uh, I for reference here and I will not go into detail I presented a couple of important work related to to this work um, as the video explained what of our main focus in this work was to try to understand how we can compose uh, interaction in one stroke so, but it's important to remember that in Corsi, you can also do interaction uh, the normal way, if you wish, by going and crossing each of the interactor one by one. So, for example, here to select the color, I will first uh, select the pen, extend a little bit to get the dialog box, then select a given width, select a given color, and just extend to have uh, the box validated. Uh, in Corsi, the borders, which are green here, are equivalent to an OK button, and the red are equivalent to a cancel button. Again, the idea here is that, for example, for this guy, I can extend and select the color and validate in one stroke. Um, as I, it's shown in the video, of course, you can do everything in uh, one stroke. And the idea behind this, this approach is that, after a while, you won't have to look really at the, at the dialog box, but you will remember that you have to do this relatively wide S. And that will, uh, for you, select the medium uh, thickness and the green color. 
Um, another very important aspect of uh, CROSSI is that since we allow for crossing, it means that we have a richer set of action we can do on each visual artifact. So for example, here's a scroll bar, the scroll bar you know, you have a different kind of interaction you can have. You can go line by line, you can go page by page, and you can have uh, an absolute area. In CROSSI, we implement um, all these features with uh, what the, the crossbar here, and the interesting aspect about it is that um, we don't have to, for example, go in a certain area to issue a command. Um, if we want to issue the command page up or page down, anywhere on the scroll bar, we just generate this gesture, and the system will uh, issue the corresponding command. Uh, as explained in the video, to repeat, you just extend. And it's a particularly interesting to see what we can do with the absolute jump. And again, the interesting thing is that you don't have to acquire the cursor compared to the normal uh, uh, click point and click interface. You just go and cross at the point where you wish to go. And when you do that, we move the cursor for you. And then right away, you are in a mode where you can do adjustment. And this adjustment can be a one-to-one -one adjustment, which is a normal uh, scroll bar system. But it, all can, it can also be. Um, uh, an adjustment where we vary the gain depending on how far you are from the scroll bar. And again, that's very important because you are in a uh, direct, absolute interaction mode, and it's important for the interface to let you uh, the freedom, to grant you the freedom to be able to interact with a lower gain for some interaction, like this kind of fine movement of the cursor inside the scroll bar. And also we use another feature, which is when you use crossing, not only you can have gesture on top of the crossing, but the direction of the crossing can be an important aspect that the interface can detect. And we use that in that case to do um, the find and replace, which in one direction do find and replace, and the other direction will uh, undo the find and replace. So what we learned during this experience was that first people seem to like it. We made a demonstration at WIST, and I think the, the the reception was very good. Uh, we uh, also demonstrated that if you use a sample interface like a click interface, the space requirement is uh, very similar. But of course, if you want people to be able to compose command in one stroke, you have to be a little bit careful not to pack your uh, widget too close to each other because in general, when people do that, they are a little bit sloppy. So you have to be careful in, in that uh, respect. Um, there is, of course, another problem, which is the overload versus easy discovery problem. And what we think is that, in general, most buttons will have a relatively simple set of commands that will be very uniform through the system that uh, will help people after maybe a couple of minutes of um, self-discovery. They will remember the key feature, like, you know, uh, the green border means that you can validate. And they will be able to... Um, use the system directly without further ado. Uh, and I think we all have to remember that uh, first, Windows still use a lot of uh, trick to help discovery, like the pop-up window. And um, I am old enough to remember when I bought my first uh, window interface for my Apple II, uh, they spent something like 10 minutes to tell me how a window system was working. So I think there is also this notion that as such a system will become more and more popular, uh, people will probably have uh, a more uh, easy access to it. Okay, so now I will uh, let uh, uh, Ken uh, present the two other system and focusing on the document area and it's uh, scribbly and stitching. Yes? Sure. Oh yeah, but I, I would give you that. Mm -hmm. How is a, a system like this going to teach me accelerators that I need as I go? So, uh, in fact, there is another system that I mentioned in my, uh, in my slides called um, uh, JDRIX here, which uh, answers this problem. And the way they answer that is that if you draw something like a question mark on top of on anything, this thing will tell you what, what it can do and what kind of gesture can be there. Uh, there is also some other thing like, you know, maybe if you just uh, over, over the, the, a specific um, 
widget, they will lack like window tell you what what's going on in there. So it is it is certainly a problem, but um, you know since, since that was our first attempt, we haven't solved that problem yet. But I, I do agree that it's something that will have to be developed further for deployment. Any other question? Sorry, guys. Just give me a second here. Okay, so um, I'm going to be using my tablet to present here just because my talk isn't on the other computer. Um, so we've been doing uh, another project is um, looking at high-performance pen interfaces. So Crossy took one approach where the interface elements are contained to the edge of the screen. Uh, and what, what we're looking at in Scribbly is a way to have a localized interface that's always right where you're working and seeing how far we can push that approach. Um, so our, our design goal is here to have a really fast and efficient interface that doesn't rely on keyboard hotkeys. Also, we're trying to come up with something where the cognitive footprint really di diminishes with the user's use of the system. So you start in sort of this recall and declarative knowledge state, and as you progress with the system, um, it just becomes these very quick practice gestures you can do. So it just migrates to procedural skill uh, that's a physical skill that the user can do very quickly with minimal demands on their attention uh, with these sort of repeatable habit-forming motions. We're also really interested in having a system that's very expressive in the sense that it can support many possible commands and command structures as well as different application requirements. So we're not trying to design something that's for specifically, you know, CAD or uh, we're trying to come up with some general behaviors that cut across a lot of tablet applications. Uh, and we're also trying to come up with a strategy where there's a nice economy of design where there's a few things the user has to learn to get started uh, but then after that, there's now sort of a new gesture for every possible command. Um, so an example of um, something where it does have that flavor is um, the sketch system from Brown, which is actually probably about 10 years old now. I don't remember exactly. But I just remember, like, I was super blown away with this work when it was first done. Uh, and it's, a, it's a classic system. Uh, but if you corner these guys and ask them, you know, what, what more can you add to the system? The answer is you can't add a single n another gesture or the whole, whole thing will fall apart. Uh, just because there's so many gestures, the design space is so constrained that if you try to add one more command to the system, it just can't go. Um, it's also somewhat hard to learn because re there really is a different gesture for everything. So they have a nice sort of you know, design where there's a consistency to the type of gestures and like they've done a good job, but it's about as far as you can push that sort of gestural approach. Um, so we wanted to take a different, different strategy for this. Uh, another classic problem that people have looked at is um, the idea of recognizing pen gestures. And so the classic question is, if I draw something on the screen, is that ink that I meant to be content to my application, or is that some kind of command that should be recognized to the computer as a gesture? Now, it's a very hard problem to do that in a robust fashion. So there's been some uh, demonstrations of in limited context where you can do something like circle something, it'll automatically recognize that's a selection. Uh, that kind of thing works. Uh, but in general, if you're saying, you know, if every possible command is going to be mixed with your ink content in this way, it becomes very hard to choose commands that aren't going to be accidentally recognized. The other problem you get into is that if you try to infer a decision about whether it's ink or gesture, you basically have to wait until the user's drawn the whole thing and then guess. So it sort of comes too late to provide interactive feedback and step-by-step -step guidance as they're going along. Um, so we're taking a different approach in our system. Which it's kind of a brute force approach. It's really just say, let's just make this a physical skill, because really all we need to solve this is one bit of information. Um, so we've explored things like putting a physical button on the bezel of the tablet. Uh, so this is sort of a habit-forming, deterministic, low-attention demand kind of thing. It's maybe a little bit of a nuisance to have to put your hand on the button at first, uh, but it's something that users can quickly habituate to. So by doing this, we can support um, commands that have some fairly sophisticated uh, structures in the system. So for example, if there's some ink on the screen, um, I can go and circle it to select it um, by hitting the gesture button and then circling. Um, but then I can progress directly from the selection uh, by continuing to hold the button to doing like a little pigtail gesture, we call it, where I just cross the gesture over its own. And so that signals to the system that I'm going from selection to a command mode. And so as soon as I do that crossing gesture, it takes the direction of the, the tail of the gesture and that becomes a marking menu command. If you haven't heard of marking menus, the basic idea is that the direction of the stroke determines the command. So you can easily have eight-way menus as sort of a, and you can do them as nested menus as well. So it kind of is a nice way to have a self-revealing command technique just with simple line strokes. 
Uh, and then from there, um, once you've selected the command, you can actually do things like you can continue to drag and copy the object. So I can select an object, I can select the command, and then I can uh, select where I want to copy it to, all in a single, uh, a single tight, fluid interaction, all without going to the edge of the screen to pick any kind of mode or tool. Um, so it's sort of a, a very quick way to do these kind of commands. So that, that's the kind of command structure we're looking at supporting. Um, so one of the key issues here is just looking at this question of how do I transition from the selection to the command phase. Um, and so we, we call that a delimiter. Um, so a pigtail is one example of a delimiter. So here if I do the pigtail and head up, that would be the cut command. If I head to the right, that could be the move command. Um, and also it depends on the type of object you select. So when I do this and then do the pigtail around some ink, it's ink commands. If it was a picture, I get commands that are relevant for a picture. Um, so I have a video of this, but I'm actually just going to jump in and do a little demo, I think. So I can write on the screen. And I don't have to worry about any gesture I do being recognized accidentally as something. Um, so when I hold down this gesture button, then I can, I'm in this mode where I can select things, for example. Uh, and if I let go of the button, I can just start over and be back to inking immediately. So it's a nice little springboard mode there. Um, so if I circle and then cross, if I just pause, I get this menu and I can sort of tool around in there and see what the options are. Um, and I can lift and it actually does it. Uh, and then I can go and say, paste the item. Let's get another page. Um, if instead, say when I'm pasting it, if I keep dragging, that's when I get this interactive behavior. So I can either sort of do it as a quick gesture where it just comes up on the screen, or I can paste and drag. Um, it also is really easy to handle disjoint selections in the same, same mechanism. So I can, for example, circle some things. And as long as I keep holding the button, I can select more stuff. And then I can do the command separately, cut it there. Um, I can also do things like have nested menus. So for example, I can go into the pens menu and then choose uh, black ink, for example. Um, so we kind of have this nice way of having all these commands in the same framework. And the, all the person really has to know is they can circle things to select them, they cross a gesture to trigger commands, and they head in one of eight directions to choose multiple commands. So those, those are the building blocks of the design. Okay, so um, one of the things we did for a Kai paper was we looked at different ways of breaking the, um, the, commands, the command from a selection stage into a, a marking menu stage where you're choosing one of eight commands. And we looked at several techniques for doing that. Uh, and so it turns out that using this pigtail type of technique is about as fast as several other options. The handle is the idea where you can circle something, you lift the pen, and then a little box appears. So you can hit the box and then draw a mark for which direction of command you want. Um, so they're about the same speed. Um, and this is sort of just performance curves over time, so sort of somewhere from that respect. Um, and uh, in terms of error rates, we, um, we looked at a couple different design iterations of the technique. It turns out there's some issues you have to handle carefully in order to recognize these things properly. Um, so there's a slight difference in the error rate. It's not too much. Uh, but basically, as people become more and more practiced with the technique, one of the things we had people do is just basically try doing the same command over and over again. And basically, as they progress with it, they get down to a point where they would just never make an error. Uh, which was very encouraging. Um, so overall, what we're trying to do here with the Scribbly is have this sort of grammar for pen input, where there's these fundamental building blocks, um, and we can link together all of these things in one command sentence. So I can have you know, uh, a noun, a verb, an indirect object, all in one sentence that I can articulate with the pen. And we're looking at ways to extend this as well to sort of other things that may be more, more complex um, where those are needed. Um, so. If there's any questions about that, maybe we can jump in with those here. Otherwise, I'll switch to the stitching project. Um, so stitching was, uh, it actually preceded Scribbly in time. Uh, and the idea here was to look at ways to link wireless devices. Um, and so when I hear the phrase wireless network, it, it kind of reminds me of the old horseless carriage where it's, it's very strange because it's describing something by what it's not. Um, so I, I find myself wondering if wired networks really are just wired networks about the wires, or maybe if they're going to allow these completely new behaviors. Um, so we were thinking about this, and one of the ideas we had for how to advance sort of the state of the art here was to use the pen as a way to allow this sort of connection between devices in this wireless soup. Um, so one of the problems that people face here is that um, 
if they're trying to share information between devices, you immediately get into this thing like, okay, what's the name of your computer? You know, what's the share? What's your email address? All that stuff. Whereas in the real world, I just say, here, take this thing, and I hand it to you, and we're done. Um, so the technology kind of interrupts the conversation and just stops things dead while you mess with the, uh, a problem that really shouldn't be a problem from the user's perspective. Um, so the idea with stitching is that I can use the pen as a way to address this. So all you do is you take the pen, you make a stroke, you start on one screen, you go to the bezel, uh, then you lift the pen and you finish the stroke on another computer. And that's, that's a way to link together the devices. Um, and the system can infer the, the, all the information it needs to form a, uh, you know, a socket connection between two devices from that. Um, so I'm going to show a video of what some of these interactions look like. Um, I don't, actually, I don't have sound hooked up to this. But I think if you just kind of see what's going on, it can talk through it some. So here I'm selecting something, I'm dragging them onto the other screen, you get a little shadow, and then I let go, and they drop, they get transferred across. So here you can actually see it shows feedback that spans the two screens. We have some tricks we're doing to actually figure out where the devices are relative to one another. So one of the things we can do is we can actually specify not only that we want to connect two devices, but what we want to bring up across and what we want to do with it when we get there. So in this one, I can sort of pause on the other side, and this menu will pop up, and I can choose different options. So that one there was to span two screens with an image. Uh, this one, the photo gallery, is kind of like a presentation mode. So I can select a picture, I drag it to the other screen, I choose this gallery mode, and now I can click on pictures here, and they get projected on the other guy's screen, basically. So there's different relationships you can set up between the two devices. Uh, another one is that you can just sort of do this quick gesture across without uh, choosing anything, and it creates this persistent connection between the two devices. And it shows this kind of this red frame around to show that, yeah, these two guys are connected. And once you've done that, you can sort of separate them and keep sort of working virtually together. Um, and so when you're in that mode, it has this transporter mechanism where I can drag stuff to the edge, and I just pause for a second. Uh, and when I do that, it actually shoots it across the other device that you're still virtually connected to. There's a nice sound effect of like the Star Trek door going, <laughs> sounds kind of cool. Um, so yeah, and all it's showing here is that basically either user can decide to break the connection at any time. So that's just another uh, dragging pictures across. Okay. Um, so that's the basic idea. The way the, the connection actually gets formed is if you kind of imagine these devices uh, sitting there and the pen comes onto the screen, you're seeing nothing, all of a sudden you see a pen stroke, then you see nothing, uh, and here the pen stroke is exiting one edge of the screen. So basically what the, the system is doing is that tablet one, the red tablet, is taking this pen stroke says, okay, I saw a pen stroke exit the screen at such and such a position at a certain time, and it just broadcasts that information. Uh, and then another tablet can do the same thing when it sees a stroke here. And our system basically takes this information, puts it all together, and says, okay, I saw a stroke start here, it ended here with the short time separation, so I know that that was a stroke spanning two screens. Um, so there really is nothing special about the pen. It's all just inferred from the timing and the geometry of the pen stroke itself. Um, one trick that we do use is that um, there's another system that a researcher named John Crum is working on called Near Me, which is a way to... Um, it doesn't do absolute location sensing, but it can determine who's close to you just using wireless, uh, wireless signal strengths. So basically, we say, okay, if two devices are close to each other and they do a gesture like this, then we're going to say that's a connection. Uh, in terms of actually figuring out where the devices are, it turns out that just by using simple trigonometry, if you see a pen strokes that exit and enter at certain positions, you can actually infer um, exactly what the relationship is. We don't actually know the, the separation between the devices, um, but in terms of actually knowing, like, this one is, you know, next to that one and up a little bit, we can determine those kind of relationships. And it turns out that's really all you need to display very convincing feedback, like was shown in the video, of things moving back and forth across the screen. And that really, that really helps to reinforce to the user what's going on, so they don't say, like, oh, this weird icon appeared out of space. They really understand where it came from and who sent it, that kind of thing. Um, another issue that we found is really important in this kind of system is just thinking about the social context of how people are using it. Um, so it turns out there's a whole branch of sociology that studies how people use space, and it's known as proxemics. 
Um, so you can sort of think of it like here's a picture. You've probably seen this scene at the airport as you were arriving, uh, where people sort of tend to sit, you know, every other chair, because um, people it, it's really uncomfortable to sit too close to strangers. And in fact, there's been quite a bit published about how to design furniture at, at airports to help people keep separate. Um, and we sort of have to keep keep this in mind. So maybe when you're going home, uh, here's, a, here's your homework assignment. Go and sit next to someone when it's not necessary to do so, and then time how long it is before they leave. And there's been a whole series of studies published in this in the 1960s. They're, they're known as invasion studies. It's so like, I think the average is like within 10 minutes, there's a 50% you know, chance the other person will leave. Now, if you're dressed poorly, if you sit next to, um, if you're a man and you sit next to a woman, like those numbers will, they'll, they'll, you know, 99%, they're out of there immediately. The other thing, yeah, the other person also doesn't want to, you know, know that that you let you know that they're uncomfortable, so they'll actually kind of wait before they leave. So there's these really interesting curves, um, and we'd like to believe that we're, you know, we're special, but you know, at some point, like this is a very deeply wired behavior. So we just found that it, it actually is really important to, and here's, you know, the cocktail party kind of zones that you see. Um, so it's actually really important to take some account in the system. Now, in the video, it always showed the devices right next to one another because it just turns out it's impossible to get a camera shot with two devices without them being crammed together like that. Um, but in terms of how the system actually works, that's not really what people want. They don't want to have to touch their devices together. And in fact, in one of our usability studies, we actually would bring people in and say, like, okay, put your devices next to each other. We're going to play around with this copying stuff across. And like almost immediately, one of the two people would raise their hand and say, you know, do they really have to be right next to one another? And be like, well, no. And then they'd separate them. They'd kind of be this, you know, foot to two foot zone where they were comfortable. Um, so, you know, on the other hand, people did see scenarios where they would want to put the devices together. So they're saying, they said things like, well, you know, if I'm working with someone on an Excel spreadsheet, it would be nice to just put them together and I could have one wide screen. Um, and, you know, it's nice that I don't have to have two faces peeking at one screen. Uh, but if you're working, you know, maybe if I'm just giving a file to someone I don't know that well, I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, so what we found is that, and sort of in the range of features that were shown in the video, you can see that there's kind of this, this sense of the devices can be very close, um, you, they can be separated, they can, you can sort of connect and then bring them apart and have this transporter. So sort of this range of, of physical separations that the different techniques can support. Um, so we found that those were very important things to consider. Um, and sort of ongoing work, another way we've been looking at to do this is not just pairs of devices, but sets of the devices. So maybe if I'm, you know, in a situation like this, if I want to give you all my talk, I don't want to have to drag it onto every screen in the room, because that'll take me a while. So one thing I could do is I could drag something to the top of my screen, and then everybody who wants it can sort of pull it from theirs. Um, and so here, the gesture, instead of one person dragging something, it's actually distributed across people. So I start the gesture, and then anyone who wants to can complete it. Um, and I might actually have veto power to say, like, oh, no, I don't want Francois to get, get this talk, or, for example. Um, so it, we call that cooperative stitching. And actually, after doing more studies, like, I think this is really the way, the best way to implement it. Um, but we actually haven't published this technique yet. That's something we're still working on. So uh, from there, maybe uh, we'll go back to Francois. Good question? Right. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not a security person. Like, that's not my expertise. So what I'm saying is, like, you know, if people want to connect a device, I'm going to make that easy, all right? So how the, the security stuff is going to be handled, in a sense, is not what I'm worried about. You know, you know having said that, I, I agree that that's a concern. It's something you would have to look at closely. One thing that really helps is actually limiting it to devices that are nearby in your physical proximity. So, you know, people are in this room, presumably there's, you know, a reason that you're here and you have the credentials. And if I'm at an airport, you know, maybe I'll just turn this off by default. Um, so I think that is something you really have to worry about, but I'm by no stretch of the imagination a security expert, so I'd like the experts in that to worry about that. <laughs> Thanks. Do you want to go back to yours? Thank you. Okay, so the, the next question for, for the rest of the talk is um, what, you, what we just described is great, and, but unfortunately is a, a picture of my desk. I should say it's a clean picture of my desk because my desk doesn't look like that at all. Um, <laughs> Um, and what you see is that even so I'm in a position where I can buy any hardware I wish, 
I'm still using paper extensively. And I'm, I don't know how many of you use paper in your everyday life where, say, editing a paper or trying to write a paper. So can we have a show of hand? Be honest. Okay, so I you know we're at Microsoft and we, for faculty summit about tablet PC, it seemed that it will be zero. They should all say, no, no, I'm not use paper, no, you must be kidding me. Uh, and in fact, I'm not kidding you, and the reason is because uh, paper is easy to navigate, it's easy to annotate, it's very well accepted in social setting, in the sense that you, you know, you don't have this kind of barrier between you and the rest of the world because your, your screen is there. And as a result, we are using paper all the time, even so we could uh, also use a tablet PC some time to time instead of paper. Uh, of course, it's clear that uh, paper has some drawback. It's very difficult to archive. It is expensive to move around. And it is a, most things are printed out, and so you cannot modify them. So after uh, working with... Um, Again, just for, for reference, is a couple of, of systems which try to bridge the gap. Um, so I should, in fact, go back to the previous slide. Um, yeah. So after working with Ken on, on this teaching problem, came the idea about, oh, can we do the same thing on paper? So can we have this kind of interaction where I can move piece of information from one printout to another printout? So the first thing you have to, to need to do that is to establish a system where you can uh, manipulate the document both on the digital world and on paper. And that's a, a paper I published in uh, 2003, which is called Paper Augmented Digital Document. And the idea is in this system is that um, you start with a document, say a Word document, and then you can interact with it in the digital world here where you can edit, search, share, do everything that you do in the digital world. Then when you wish to get the affordance of paper, you will simply print it using our system, and then you will be able to use the pen which are currently circulating to annotate directly on the printout. And then when you are done with that, you will simply synchronize the pen, and all the information which has been captured on the paper world will be transferred back to the digital world and appear on top of your digital document. Uh, the key idea here, as, as the name of the slide says, is that it's cohabitation. We are not saying that any medium is better than the other one. We just say when you want to pick a medium, you have the freedom to go there, do whatever you have to do there, and then come back. So um, this was made possible with a technology which is called the Anoto technology. So I have several pens circulating around. And I'm not going to circulate this one because, as you see, it has some mutation going on. And um, so this pen has a very small camera in the, in the tip of the pen and a, uh, an infrared source. And they can read a pattern which is printed on paper but appear like a, a light gray. And I think there is a book also circulating around so you can look at it. And it's really appear, uh, when it's printed correctly, it's really appear like a light gray. So the important thing about the system is that it's absolute so that not only do I get where I am on the page, but I get the unique page number I am on. So of course, if we have a system like that uh, with a little bit of engineering, you can establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, a digital page, which was printed on a physical page, and that's what our system does. When you print, we, we take a snapshot of the document, we send the document to the printer, and we uh, record the correspondence between a digital page and a um, physical page. So when you will synchronize your pen, a stroke collector will observe all these strokes, query the database, and say, oh, this stroke were made on such a page of such a document and then transfer all the information into the corresponding document. So now, when you have this uh, kind of architecture in place, my desk become again something which is, which is digital because all these pieces of paper are now a proxy of a digital document which is probably somewhere on my hard drive. And of course, a key aspect of the system is that most of the document we have around us come from our computers, so we have a digital copy of this document somewhere on our hard drive. Um, so 
now the question is, okay, so I have all this kind of proxy of document which I can see as a separate device on which I will interact. So they're kind of, you know, low-level device. They can only display, it's only static, and the only thing they can do for you is collect your stroke. But nevertheless, you can really see them as a piece of hardware which is there and behaving a little bit like a computer. So the question is, okay, now we have all this thing. It seems to be very, very close to the stitching operation. So is it possible for me to have uh, a command system on w which will help me issuing command on paper document? And this system is called Papier Craft, and I will uh, show you a video of the system in a second. As soon as... So I, I think I will have to eject the disk, so it should give me a second. Does someone know how to get to the menu of the, the player? Okay. Oh, oh, you're right, menu button, you're right. Oh, restarting it is a good way to. Um, okay, so, uh, is, uh, so that's a paper which has been accepted for WIST and will be published. Paper is used extensively by knowledge workers during knowledge gathering and crystallization. Using paper, Users can navigate through several documents by spreading them on their desks and annotating them with ease. During their work with paper, they create a rich web of inter-document links by including references in their notes and sometimes by creating collages. Unfortunately, links created on paper are difficult to transfer back into the digital realm. While digital solutions such as OneNote can capture these links, they are limited by the size of the screen on a standard tablet PC. In this video, we present PapiaCraft, a system that lets users manipulate digital documents using paper printouts as proxies. To copy an image, the user selects the area of interest with a pair of crop marks and then draws the copy mark. Back on the user's notes, the user draws another pair of crop marks to indicate where the figure should be pasted and then draws the paste mark. Upon pen synchronization, the operations performed on the printouts are carried out on their corresponding documents and their results can be seen on our document viewer. To distinguish between normal annotation and commands, the user presses the command button, a simple foot pedal in our current implementation. While the pedal is pressed, gestures such as this margin bar will be recognized as part of the copy command. With another gesture, the paragraph and its annotations are pasted in the user's notes. Both a snapshot of the selected paragraph and the user's strokes drawn on top of it will be available inside our note viewer. As a convenience, the viewer also provides access to the underlying text. PapiaCraft commands may also have several parameters. Here, a user first selects a paragraph and then underlines an indexing keyword before drawing the copy gesture. Upon pasting, the selected paragraph will be tagged with the underlined keyword. PapiaCraft commands may also span multiple documents. For example, one can pin two pieces of paper on top of each other by using the stitch command. The tip of the stitching marks is the position of the anchor. To make it easy to extend the PapiaCraft command set, it is also possible to write the name of the command one wishes to execute. Writing the name of a command always overrides the simple default gesture, as shown here where the word paste overrides the copy gesture. This feature also makes it easier to read back one's commands on the paper printouts. We have presented PapiaCraft, a system that lets users manipulate digital documents by using printouts as proxies. While our current prototype focuses on active reading, we believe that PapiaCraft can be easily extended to a wide range of activities where paper is still used extensively. Okay, so um, I guess I don't need to go through that. It's what the video described. You circle the text, you make the gesture, then you uh, create 
the scope where the paste comment will appear. And of course, you have to indicate that because there is no feedback. So if you were just to create a paste comment there, you will not know that something has been uh, pasted there. And then upon pen synchronization, we uh, do the magic of uh, recovering the information from there and pasting the information directly into your notes. Um, so uh, as you may have uh, seen from the video, the system has, has, is very similar to uh, something that I can describe as scribbly on paper, if you wish. Um, uh, we use uh, the same system, a command button, to make a distinction between gesture and ink. Uh, we use a very similar set of, of scope, which are well adapted in our case in the kind of scope you find in uh, proofreading, for example. And then the common selection is either by marking menu, which is fine, but as a limited um, set of eight commands if you don't have a hierarchy. So what we did, as presented in the video, is that you can also write down the prefix um, of any command, an ambiguous prefix of a command, and then the system will uh, interpret that and uh, issue the, the corresponding command. And of course, an important part of the system is that everything is done in, ba in batch processing, which sometimes has very uh, uh, positive aspect because you have you know, infinite time and you can go backward in time and forward in time to make your decision because you have all the information at once. Um, so we did a very short uh, evaluation of this uh, system, and in fact, people uh, really like the idea of being able to do that, especially when they will do something like uh, knowledge gathering and crystallization, where you know they have several paper in front of them and they want to kind of create an abstract of all these papers. Um, they they say, in fact, that it will be if the system has a very high level of recognition for the gesture, the current level of feedback, which is only the stroke you have on the paper, uh, will be sufficient. But uh, we feel that definitively we'll have to add better feedback, either by having an LED shining on the paper to uh, say, okay, you know, this, this stroke has been recognized, or maybe using something like tactile feedback. And uh, finally, it seems that um, people are not too concerned about the fact that when you paste a piece of information, you do not see the piece of information itself. Uh, what they told us is that, you know, there is a lot of context around it that will tell us what this piece of information happened to be. And, of course, in our system, they are completely free to write down in the, in the space delineated by the mark figure X or something like that. What we are doing is just helping them making the connection and transferring the data automatically when they will be back at their desk. Okay, so I think it's time to, to conclude. And uh, what we did today is to present uh, four different systems who try to uh, uh, bridge the gap between the um, digital tablet interface, if you wish, the digital world of pen computing and the ease of use of paper. And our goal is to deliver the, uh, an interface which are both powerful, sorry, but also uh, as easy to use as paper is uh, right now. And uh, as the, the video, um, in fact, didn't show because that's a short version, um, we are already hoping to be able to have a seamless integration with both media and our system, PapierCraft, for example. You can do a copy and paste between a piece of paper and your tablet. So at some point, you don't have to think about what media you are on. Whatever is convenient for you, you can use it, and then uh, after that, we will kind of you know, patch the, the, the interaction so that it feels natural for you. Is there any question? Yes? Um, how are you linking the paper document to the electronic document? Uh, um, by that, I mean, the yeah. paper graph. By that I mean when you're making your edits and you synchronize, uh, you go back to your document, mm -hmm. and your edits get loaded into the electronic document. Yeah. And how does the system know which paper document corresponds to which electronic document? So it's based on SIS architectures or the PAD architecture. So each time you print something, we, we save um, a snapshot of what you print, the real document of what you print. So when we receive the stroke, since we register also the correspondence between the pattern on the physical page and the paper here, and the, sorry, the, the digital page, we, the, the system just go and ask the, the pad infrastructure, okay, I receive a stroke on this page, give me this page, and then you can do whatever you want with the stroke. Right? You can say, oh, I think it's a copy stroke. And then uh, you, you delineate the information you want to copy and then 
process in the digital world normal way and then send that to the target piece of paper. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yes? So I don't the yeah. So the the thing about the camera is I don't see the text. The camera only see sees very small pattern. The text is printed on top of it, and in fact the camera doesn't see the text because we are careful to print it in uh, something which is transparent. And and then so it doesn't matter, either, right? I mean, it just the camera is completely oblivious about what is on top. That, that's how our infrastructure which does that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And they have many pages. They have two at the power 48 page, which, by the way, seem very large, but it's only something like three, day, or three years of world consumption of page or flat paper. Uh-huh. Yeah, so right now, so yeah, I, 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 I was very careful saying that we take a snapshot of the document. So that as you print, the infrastructure take a, a real snapshot of what you are printing right now. And then we will do all the operation on sysing because we know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence with the printout. And then we let the other people worried about version control. <laughs> but you're right, it's, a, <laughs> it's an important problem, but it's not really our problem. But it, it's a good point. Both things can change, yes. Any other question? Okay, great. So I think uh, now it, it's your turn, and we have something fun. And uh, so, do you need something for the? Do you need to connect to this guy? Okay. It's not fun. It's also serious. Oh, that. <laughs> it doesn't imply anything like that. Okay, um, I'd like to show you something uh, uh, pretty brief about um, some work we're doing on 3D uh, understanding of, uh, of sketches. So uh, the basic idea behind this is that um, is for computer-aided design applications. So computer-aided design in engineering involves creation of three-dimensional objects. It's all about manipulation of objects. Uh, and uh, creating new geometry and editing three-dimensional geometry. And that's something that is an integral part of, of uh, engineers, uh, design engineers' life when it comes to uh, mechanical engineering, uh, civil engineering, architecture, anything that has to do with three-dimensional geometry. So uh, what we're looking at is are ways for people to communicate uh, geometry in a very, using sketching, which is kind of the oldest way of conveying uh, three-dimensional geometry way before and, and, uh, and so forth. So we want to have something that is very intuitive, uh, something like a sketch out ideas and be able to, uh, to uh, convey this information, not only convey three-dimensional information, but also get some feedback about the physics and the mechanical properties of the objects that you're working with. As an example, we have something uh, uh, such as the image, which is an object, uh, have the computer understand the of that, that drawing. So that drawing over there 
Uh, you can understand it as a three-dimensional object, but really it's just a collection of lines on a flat piece of paper on the flat tablet. Uh, we'd like the computer to be able to analyze that, whatever analysis uh, uh, is, is appropriate for, for your domain. Uh, and then uh, you can get some feedback on whether you like it or not. And, if, and, and uh, if, if it is okay, then you might move on to a standard CAD system. So it's a, it's a way to get uh, uh, feedback on your design at the preliminary explorative uh, stage, uh, which is characterized often by sketching. Here's an example application. Not a, this, is, uh, from, uh, this is not done on a tablet PC. I'll show you something on the tablet in a moment. Uh, so here's a sketch uh, of an object. In this case, it's a, uh, it's an, it's a sheet metal prod, uh, product. So this is a sketch of uh, something that you would make out of sheet metal. Uh, and this is a scale. Uh, what you can see there at the top is the reconstructed model, a three-dimensional object reconstructed from that, uh, from that drawing. And what you can see below it are flat patterns or unfolding of this object. And this is important for sheet metal production. So you have, you start with a three-dimensional object and you draw it out and then the computer might say, well, the, in order to fabricate that, you need to fabricate these two flat patterns and then assemble it. So this is already a very important piece of information if you're a production engineer because it means that this shape can only be fabricated using two pieces, which means it uh, uh, would be very expensive to fabricate. You cannot fabricate that using a single piece. So that's a kind of quick, important feedback you can get on a sketch immediately uh, that would normally take you a lot of analysis to do using conventional modeling but we would like to be able to generate that, that kind of uh, feedback uh, just by looking at the sketch. So, so the computer here reconstructed the three-dimensional model, generated this, uh, and then overlaid, the, and this is the optimal uh, way of unfolding this object, overlaid the sketch back, these bend marks overlaid it back on the sketch. So the feedback is again in the sketch mode, and you can see here, this is the, the way that this, this part would be made. So, Computer, so the person basically sketches this and gets back this kind of information. Um, okay, here's another, uh, another different type of analysis, uh, which is structural analysis. A picture on the left, uh, and you can see it folds. Uh, it collapses as the way it's, it's uh, structured, but if you put in some bracing elements and it holds together. So the idea is that you interact in 3D with, with physics. Um, a final example before I actually uh, explain a little bit about the, how it works is, uh, is actually prototyping. So here's, a, again, this is a sketch. The lines have been straightened out. And then we connect this to a rapid prototyping machine, which is not very rapid these days. It takes uh, about a day to print this. But maybe in the future it will be really rapid. And you can sketch something out and get a physical model based on, on the sketch alone. Okay, so uh, I won't go into details, but here's the basic idea of how, uh, of the challenge. The challenge is moving from a 2D set of lines, which are uh, flat on, on a page, into 3D. The problem is there are many different objects that have this kind of projection, and we don't know which of the uh, depth, we don't know the depth that is assigned to each each uh, vertex, and that's uh, really the challenge. So there are infinite number of objects that could have this projection. The question is, which one uh, do, does the user intend? And when we humans look at a sketch, we can usually infer that pretty easily. But that's still, uh, uh, this is essentially a challenge in machine uh, vision. So it doesn't matter if you're looking at perspective projections or uh, orthogonal projections, there's still this missing uh, depth dimension that you need to, uh, to get. Okay, so I'll demo this, uh, uh, this software, it's, uh, a 3D journal, and this is, uh, it's kind of based on the idea of, uh, of the Windows journal. We kind of stole the interface, and we added this depth dimension into, all, into uh, the ink. So we kind of think of it as uh, 3D ink, and it's available at this URL if you'd like to download it and, and try it out for yourself. I'll put that URL back on later on. Okay, so let me... So what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, draw a 
me just get the pen. I'll draw a uh, an object, and I'll do some finite element analysis on it, which again we would usually take uh, quite sophisticated software and some modeling time. Okay, I missed this line. But you can see already that uh, this is a three-dimensional object. Okay, I drew it in, in 2D, but it's recognized as a three-dimensional object. Okay. So uh, now this, it depends on what kind of analysis you want to do. But let me, for example, anchor this uh, uh, thing over here. It's solid. it's solid, yeah. Once I take, uh, when I took one of the faces off, then it, uh, the only way to interpret it, as it was uh, as being a, uh, a surface manifold. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. So let's apply a force here. Okay, so you can see the uh, it's tessellated, and this is the resulting analysis. So this is a very crude tessellation, but you can see how, you know, where the stress concentration are near the near where it's harnessed, and you can see more or less what what the shape uh, does. So this is a, a full finite element analysis of an object, um, and it gives you the kind of feedback uh, that would normally take a while uh, and some skilled uh, modeling. So we're planning to use this kind of uh, this kind of technique uh, for the exploratory design stage um, and for teaching. So when we explain, when we teach about how, uh, when we teach uh, uh, statics of materials, uh, properties of materials and so forth, for example, this would be very convenient to be able to do on the, on the blackboard and get some immediate feedback. So uh, this project at this moment is, is, is being developed as a kind of open source. So this is a, we, the finite element analysis itself uh, is a standard finite element uh, code that's available on the web, and we just used it for, for this application. But you could plug in your favorite uh, analysis code for whatever domain uh, you want, be it MEMS or architecture uh, and so forth, uh, and hopefully use this kind of three-dimensional interaction uh, and analysis combined to, uh, to accelerate the design uh, process. Thank you. So um, let me just put this um, URL in case you're interested in trying this out. Yeah. So, uh, of the areas that this works really well in, mm -hmm. you saw some of that. What are the, the actual areas where it's better problematic that you're contemplating working on now? Um, well, we want to uh, to f continue focusing on the on the finite element for a while because the finite element is a basic analysis that you can that people have done spent careers on uh, doing all kinds of things. So this is stress analysis. You could do a fluid flow using finite element. You could do a lot of uh, this. Almost all of engineering uh, analysis is based on finite element. So uh, once so this is actually why we chose the finite elements because it opens the door to do so many things. So we're going to explore that. Um, I think well, so. One of the next areas is trying to integrate, like some of the ideas that, that, that you guys presented, on how to uh, make the pen interaction smoother and, and allow people to 
um, specify uh, things like the forces and, uh, and material properties and so forth using gestures to make that even, uh, even smoother. Oh yeah, I, I actually okay. So I, I press the the barrel pen, uh, the barrel button, uh, which uh, when the barrel button is pressed, it means I want to spin my sketch in 3D. So that triggers the yeah. So I didn't say that. That's a good point. Yeah. So when when I press the barrel point uh, uh, button, then the cursor changes and I'm in spin mode. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but it's it's uh, the the RAM is consumed by the finite element analysis. That's what's uh, taking most of the that's the the actual processing of the sketches is not the is not what is not the drain on the CPU. It's doing the analysis. So uh, the resolution, the finite element uh, resolution that I used to break down the object, that was more or less what I could do in uh, well, that was governed by the requirement to have the result in interactive time. I wanted to finish the analysis within three seconds. Um, but you could increase that if you want. You can do a full-blown analysis, but you have to wait uh, a couple of minutes. Could you um, correct? I mean, I mean, I know there's two right angles, or right angles, and neither are mine. Um, you have yeah. a little option where you can make it a real yeah. Um, that is more difficult than, than it seems. So we, we'd like to have a, a beautify button. That here's my rough sketch, fix it. You know what I mean, uh, uh, right? Well, so um, so we're doing things like uh, uh, we're working on things like you know uh, making things that are almost right angles, exactly right angles, things that are almost uh, uh, the same length, exactly the same length, uh, things like that. And that might that might help a little bit, yeah. But it uh, appears to be more challenge, more challenging. Yeah. How hard would it be to draw a hollow box? I can't see how. A hollow box. Um, you would need to actually draw it with a thin. Uh, you would actually need to draw a the thin boundary. Right. So that would be pretty difficult. Yeah. Um, or. Yeah. And there's some extent to which I feel it would be easier to draw a hollow box there, and I can't figure out in 3D how easy it would be. Yeah. So, so um, if it is, if it, if it's, um, I don't know. I mean, there, there are things that. Uh, how would you draw that on a piece of paper? I mean, the, the, right. So there are things that maybe are not amenable to drawing on a piece of paper. Uh, also, uh, Randy Davis explained, I think, yesterday that there are some things that are explained that are better conveyed using other model, uh, modes of interaction, like like verbal interaction. So you might be able to uh, specify this symbolically, this is hollow, or say it. So I don't think everything in, 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 in geometry is conveyed by sketching, but certainly uh, geometric details uh, can be specified more quickly by sketching than, than conventional methods. Thank you.